In all fairness, we must point out that many of the subjects which we wish to discuss this evening still remain among the great unsolved mysteries of life. This should not too greatly perturb us, however, for the simplest elements of living that we know are actually equally mysterious. We have made a great study of the origin of man, merely through the mystery of human birth. And yet the process is involved in the actual development of the embryo. And the forces behind the, fo the molding and shaping of the future body of a living person, these remain mysteries even now. When we come to solve these mysteries to our own satisfaction, it merely means that we attain an unbroken record of those changes and processes which are visible to us. Those parts which are invisible, those causal elements, substances and principles, still elude the intellectual quest with which man seeks to solve the riddle of himself. Therefore, when we go back into the great eras of time, to the great primordial world, we cannot go with complete certainties. Even records brought through from extrasensory perception sources are by no means in conformity. This does not necessarily indicate contradiction, for it may be that these records relate to different phases of the innumerable processes which came together to form the present state of things. In any event, however, one of our primary questions has always been, how did life get to the earth? One of the great scientific stoppers in this is the condition of the earth in its earliest stages. We assume that it was a molten mass, that it gradually crystallized into its material form as a result of innumerable ages, aeons of time and that this gradual cooling finally brought the earth to a condition in which it could sustain the various types of flora and fauna which first appeared. The problem of how life survived this tremendous transition from a molten mass to a reasonably organized, habitable world is a mystery. But we can again bring to bear upon it certain known elements and out of the subconscious of man, which must finally be our greater source of information, there comes again this pageantry of legend, of myth, and of story, by which it seems that we are seeking to answer through dreams and visions the questions that we ask. If it is true that life as we know it could not survive the terrific, incalculable combustion of the first age, then we are confronted with several questions. If life could not begin upon the earth with its own beginning, could not have come here with the fire, mist, and the vapors, which ultimately uh, united to form a planet, then it had to be communicated in some way from elsewhere, from some other state or condition, in order that the earth might be fruitful and bear the kinds and forms of life that we know. Actually, we do not know that life could not have survived the terrific incendiary state of the primordial world. But this that we do know, that life as we understand it today could not have survived. That it would have been incinerated in all its structures and forms. That it would have been incapable of reproducing itself or surviving. Therefore, we must either assume that a hypothesis about the beginning of the planet is wrong, or we must assume that our understanding of the substance and essence of life itself must be wrong, or we have some other choices. 
we can also consider the possibility of life coming here or reaching here from some state in which it could survive and by circumstances and means sufficiently natural and non-miraculous to explain how this planet or perhaps all other planets could have in the beginning have been populated with some kind of creatures of which man is to our mind and thinking the outstanding example. The Greeks help us a little in this, the Hindus also, Chinese have a few suggestions, and the Egyptians have contributed something. From their various speculations we arrive at certain hypotheses, and these are varyingly reasonable and uh, their final solution depends upon a greater knowledge of the substance and function of essential life principles than we have today. Therefore we cannot assume a bigoted attitude or feel that any reasonable or plausible answer must inevitably be correct. Today in our thinking we must seek for such answers as are most reasonable according to our knowledge, praying that additional knowledge may make us more reasonable and also ultimately convey up to us an insight that is adequate. One possible solution uh, to this mystery was given to us by ancient peoples who declared that the life principle itself or the life essences by which all things are sustained actually is always and eternally within the power and ray of the sun. Therefore that any field upon which the ray of the sun descends or against which the ray of the sun is reflected receives not only light but a life principle locked in light and therefore as soon as the earth itself was able to sustain the light which the sun could bestow upon it. The sunlight itself carried the necessary life units. And therefore, that life began as the result of sun, earth, and moisture. That this was apparently a spontaneous development, but that in accordance with the concept of the ancients, the light itself was the power of God or the power of life. This life meeting a proper element, finding in its questing out of things an appropriate ground into which it might penetrate, caused a certain fertilization of matter. And from these two, with moisture and the various vicissitudes of the seasons, there resulted what might have been regarded at first as a spontaneous generation. Spontaneous only because man has not yet realized that spirit, matter, and moisture constitute the three essential elements by which all life comes into manifestation. The persons and schools of thought embracing this concept did not actually believe that this life carried for the sun was merely a physical thing. Nor did they believe that the form generated by this life had merely a physical existence. These forms or bodies became the instruments for the inner energies of this life. For as surely as the visible ray of the sun conveys certain germinal powers, so the sun also has locked within it the psychic life and the spiritual life of man. Thus to these ancient thoughts all life comes from the sun, which is the generator, the redeemer, the creator, and the renovator of all things. And wherever in the solar system the ray of the sun can strike, in that place there can be living things growing up, each according to the environment and circumstances in which it finds itself. This might be termed in general the solar theory of life. 
A second theory, which also had considerable uh, acceptance among the Hindu peoples in ancient times, was that the entire story of the generation of a planet is exactly the same on a microcosmic level as the generation of man himself on a microcosmic level. The body of man created in the womb uh, gradually unfolds its integrated structure until it can be quickened. And at that time, an abiding life enters into it, enters into it totally and collectively, and souling it. So that, as one of the ancient writers said, the earth becomes the body of a blessed God. The Emperor Julian refers to this in his hymn to the Mother of the Gods. This ensoulment of the planet by a God was held by some people to explain how life became available here. It was then no longer simply a life brought here from the outside, but a total being coming into embodiment, coming into incarnation from a previous state. And according to the ancient peoples, the earth spirit that took upon itself the body of our planet came here from a previous embodiment, and that previous embodiment was the moon. Therefore, the moon is the cast-off body of the planetary Logos, or Ishvara, the lord of this world. If, therefore, a being comes into embodiment by the quickening process of a planet gradually unfolding its structure like an embryo until it can be embodied, thus serving as an instrument for a rational spiritual entity, then as in the case of man, many mysteries seemingly are explained. If they are not explained, they are at least acceptable by comparison with other known things. As, for example, that in all probabilities there are as many separate living creatures within man as there are separate living creatures on the face of the earth. There are hundreds of billions of living things working together, conspiring together, laboring together in order that man may have the compound structure that he now knows. The ancients believed that in some way the lives of these things came into man with the collective consciousness of himself. Therefore, having once established his own conscious polarity, the life in man begins to unfold out of its own nature the infinitude of parts which are gradually to become lesser centers of life within its compound structure. This, then, is an ensoulment idea, and perhaps is one of the most interesting and dramatic of all the solutions that have been given. In taking this, we then pass through a modification, because we not only study embryology as it is now physically studied, but we have to consider it in the terms of ancient thought. If we wish, for example, uh, to accept or to consider seriously the idea of the planet as an ensouled being, Plato's animal crawling through space, if we wish to take this attitude, then we must try to understand a little more about how the ancients understood <coughs> the quickening process relating to man. They held that the human body was worked upon in two ways. First, from without, by an invisible magnetic field of the entity that was later to occupy it. This entity, enclosing a certain area, protects the embryo, molding it into the archetype of the magnetic field of the entity itself, thus moving upon it, or as it is said in Genesis, the spirits of the Elohim moved upon the face of the deep. These spirits moving upon the face of the deep were regarded in India and other ancient nations as powers moving over the surface of an embryo world or an embryo being, molding it, modeling it, influencing, affecting it, 
gradually bringing it into the organization which must later sustain the incarnation of this being. When a certain degree had been reached of development, then these powers moved into embodiment, and taking up their places in the seven sacred centers within man, began to rule from within. Then their energies and their powers and their will and their dictum ideated from the centers of man, gradually working upon the body, controlling it and directing it. Quickening then was the process by which forces operating on the outside uh, in the form of a circle uh, moving inward from all of its own circumference, moving inward finally inhabit this body which is being formed in their common center. And having inhabited the body, they begin to radiate out to fill the field of the circle which they originally occupied. Thus, quickening is a process of a life taking up an internal residence within a structure and continuing to move and to refine and to perfect that structure accomplishing things that could not be done merely by molding its external development. Thus in the case of a planet it is also conceivable and was so held by Plato and some other Greeks that the life principle, the God whose body was to become the planet operated from a series of superphysical planes or circles which in a concentric way surrounded the physical planet. These planes or circles were regions, and in these regions there dwelt or existed the orders of life which were later to become embodied. This same idea carries into the medieval Jewish Kabbalah, where we find uh, the various rings or circles from which life falls or descends into generation. Plato declared in one occasion that souls coming into generation fell through the circles of creation from their home in the Milky Way. Thus they descended a ladder of rings or rounds, like the mysterious ladder of Jacob upon which the angels ascended and descended. By this concept, light reached the planet from the power or nature of the being that ensouled the planet, and prior to the time in which such lives could exist here, they were held in suspension in the superphysical magnetic fields which came into existence before the planet itself was formed. Then gradually, as the convolutions and elements and substances and conditions upon the planet changed, these various waves of life descended into the orders of living things through a perpetual flowing of ensoulment. Uh, thus uh, explaining perhaps one of the verses of Genesis in which it says that the sons of God beheld the daughters of men and saw that they were fair and descended unto them. By this would mean that spiritual beings uh, abiding in various orders in hierarchs similar to those described by Dante in the Divine Comedy, that these beings waited or remained uh, in their various planes or levels until forms appropriate to their development were generated here. And when the form bodies were equal to the need of the levels of consciousness, these levels descended, entered into them, and began to evolve through them. This is the idea uh, that life, by being essentially positive in the psychic body of the earth rather than in its material body, was not subject to destruction by such combustions as might have made the early part of the physical planet incapable of sustaining life or even having, uh, having destroyed any previous life that might have been available to it. This brings us then to another concept relating to these subjects. This deals with the existence of free life in space. Uh, various stratosphere researchers at a considerable height have found that in the higher parts of our atmosphere, as far as we have been able to check it up to now, that there are spores 
or units of life, almost germinal, seed-like, we seem to be able to exist and survive in free space. These beings or these units, these seed lives, remind us that only under certain conditions can the seed life release its energy. And up to that time it will remain seed-like, thus protecting its energy. And such protection can continue for vast periods of time, even under the most adverse circumstances. The wheat that was buried 5,000 years ago, clenched in the fist of a mummified Egyptian pharaoh, and subject to treatment with herbs and bitumen and many other things used in the embalming of the dead, taken from the tomb after 5,000 years and planted in the earth grew, indicating that there is a tremendous power of life to remain itself or to carry and sustain its own principles until such times as an appropriate environment for the release of that life may be available. Under such conditions it is not an extravagance to assume the possibility that free spores in space are in a preserving but non-germinating condition, that space in itself will not cause them to manifest their life potential, but it will preserve them, protect them, and sustain them for an indefinite and infinite period of time, until through circumstances of one kind or another they are drawn within the atmospheric field of a planet. Having been so drawn, and having been once captured in the atmosphere, processes begin to take place within them, and they finally falling through this atmosphere reach the earth, and having come into an atmosphere suitable for germination, they immediately begin to release the kind of life that they contain. This has several interesting concepts in connection with it. First, it would fulfill the ancient belief that pure space is pure life. Therefore, that actually space is the common ground of all existence. That it is not the earth but space that is the custodian of life. Also it would imply that if in interplanetary and even intersolar space that these spores may be found to be at least generally distributed, it may then re may remind us that one essential form of life is behind the diversified manifestation in all parts of a solar system. If the spore theory can be completely sustained, we have almost certain grounds for assuming that all other planets are inhabited, that life exists on all of them. For we are not to assume for a moment that only one atmosphere and one kind of atmosphere is suitable for the expression of these lives. Held in suspension, they will express in any atmosphere or any circumstance in which it is possible for them to release their internal power of expression. It is true undoubtedly that under various conditions in various environments this release will be different and that the degree of growth may be different and that the specialized nature of these creatures as they evolve may be different. But we have no ground for assuming that anywhere in space where a planet capable of sustaining life exists, that that planet does not sustain life, and that therefore life in the sense of growing and unfolding creatures of various types must be regarded and accepted as a universal phenomenon, not merely a local one. Now there are other theories, but perhaps these are enough to show the general trend, and we cannot uh, pause to analyze just this one phase of the subject indefinitely. We therefore can choose between several of these different explanations, and in so choosing we may pause and wonder whether they are all not the same thing said in different ways, that actually we are dealing not with a series of conflicting stories, but a series of accounts specialized from various points of view and involving various stages in the development of a single basic idea. This idea, because it is archetypal, 
because it has been shared by nearly all of the great religious and philosophical institutions of mankind, seems to be founded in reason, and there apparently is no reason why we should suspect reason, that that which is essentially reasonable is as true as that which is demonstrable. For reason must precede demonstration in nearly every branch of knowledge, even in our common experience. One thing we are forced to admit, and that is that life did get here. Uh, just exactly what happened to it afterwards is a moot question, but uh, that it arrived at some remote time seems to be reasonably evident. And while there are systems of philosophy that will deny this, we are not liable to be deeply moved by them at the moment. Assuming that, therefore, light reached here, we also know that once it did reach here, it began to leave faint impressions of itself in the records of nature. And by degrees, these records enlarge and increase. And so finally, we have a rather adequate power or ability to reconstruct uh, the primordial world in its relation to man. This brings us, however, upon the horns of one rather definite dilemma, one that we have to analyze a little more carefully, because here we do come into a conflict about which some uh, rationale must be established. Are we going to assume that all life that comes here is of the same quality? The Spore theory would make this seem scientifically possible. In other words, how are we to differentiate between these free seed germs in space to determine whether one is older, wiser, or better than another? We must, in order to advance such a hypothesis, go into a process of regressive evasion, trying to find cause, which would carry us far beyond the feeble boundaries of our common sense. We could not attempt to go beyond this point. To do so would be to go beyond all theoretical as well as practical experience. But if we assume uh, that the Spore theory is correct, then we have certain problems arising in our evident in our effort to explain what happens later. We get ourselves into some difficulties on this count. For we do observe an almost immediate specialization. We discover something in nature which becomes part of our anthropological thinking at a later date. And that is that from the most remote times there is evidence of specialization in living things. Even in the most elementary reconstructions of the most ancient and remote geological periods, we do not find just one kind of fish fossil. We do not find just one kind of fern fossil. We find from the very beginning the appearance of genera, of species, of types of things. Consequently, there has to be some explanation which enables an early specialization, a remote specialization. The answer to specialization, as far as we generally think of it, lies in uh, what someone has called uh, longitude and latitude, and which on a less ethical level has been referred to as longitude and lassitude. In this particular problem, however, our prehistoric world, if we are correct about it, did not present a particularly <coughs> glamorous variety of environments. At some very early time, when these species were already beginning to distinguish themselves from each other, we have a rather monotone kind of world for this distinguishing to take place. We do not have, we did not have the world we have now with an infinite diversity of climates, with mountains and seashores and all the different things which might result in environmental modifications. 
The prehistoric world seems to have presented one vast environment, all very much, all its parts very much alike. Yet in a situation which we are unable to distinguish into comparative and relative areas of experience, we still find this specialization taking place. In fact, it seems to have taken place from the very beginning. Thus, whatever happened, we cannot assume that one type of life or one type of energy uh, actually is responsible for the complete diversity which we know. In the abstract, yes, one divine life can animate all these things, even as rain falling upon the earth will support, sustain, sustain, strengthen, and assist in the growth of an infinite diversity of forms of life. But the rain does not primarily create these forms of life. It merely nourishes them. And whatever the nourishing power of space may be, may sustain all kinds of life. But according to our general thinking, we are not aware of why and how immediate and remarkable specialization should arise from some common source of nutrition or some common source of life energy. Now as evolution proceeds and we come more and more into the light of things, we might assume that man also, by standardizing his environment, gradually overcomes separateness and that in the course of ages even human growth would have resulted in men becoming more similar than they appear to be today. Yet this evolutionary process has not resulted in the production of a single superior type. It has resulted in the continuation of individual types. And now anthropology and sociology frankly admit that it is utterly ridiculous to attempt to determine which of any group is the superior one, or which of any group of groups is the superior group because superiority is always invested in the ego of a dominant class but has no essential substance in nature. It is like trying to say that a large grapefruit is more highly developed because it is larger than a fully matured prune. Actually, the fully matured prune is just as important, just as mature, just as developed although it may be only a tenth the size. Therefore, size, color, appearance, these things do not determine value, except when viewed from a purely relative, arbitrary point of view. So we are not dealing actually with an effort to define which one of these forms of life is the best, and we're not sure nature ever intended anything to come to this conclusion. What we are concerned with is that evolution is an infinite individualization of life, moving through innumerable forms and bringing each of these forms to a kind of relative maturity. From this point on, these forms pass into transition and either move into superior forms or else die out. But always these forms continue to unfold their own potentials according to their own natures. Thus at the beginning of things we have to accept that the universe produced more than one kind of growth impulse, more than one kind of conditioning life energy. This brings immediately, of course, to our mind the variation between this theory and that of evolution as we find it in the Darwinian theory. We come suddenly to the consideration of this most important point. At what time in the development of life upon the earth was it predestined and foreordained that a horse should be a horse? Did this arise at some time? Or was horse always horse? By the same consideration, we know that horse has passed through various evolutionary processes, by means of which its form has been modified to a considerable degree. 
it is perfectly possible to trace horse back to a general form which can no longer be recognized as horse. And as we go further and further back in all of these different groups, we seem to come back into various forms of life which can no longer be clearly differentiated from each other, until we like to assume, perhaps, that the entire thing began as a group of polywogs in a cosmic puddle. But the question we're interested in is, were those polywogs all alike in the first place? They might have looked alike, but were they alike? If they were alike, why did they cease to be alike? If they all had within themselves the identical potential, why did some develop this potential more than another than others? Why did one little strain of this original group of polywogs develop into a horse and another strain into a baboon? Why did one group ultimately produce the hyena and another group pr produce the benign and kindly cow? Why was this differentiation? Are we to assume that a hyena is an unadjusted cow. <laughs> that somewhere along the line it rebelled against being a cow for reasons unknown and by environment and circumstances became a hyena. Well, if we said that way it sounds ridiculous, but if you say it in Latin it sounds rather important. <laughs> also, it gains great verisimilitude if the right people say it. But the question is, are they saying anything? Is it true that the differentiations between these creatures are due entirely to psychic pressure? That is, pressure of reaction to environment and heredity. If all things began the same, we must assume that they had about the same heredity. If that is true, by what force did heredity result in the various changes, the mutations and the developments of these various forms of life? If we take the environment theory totally, how are we to understand the differences which arise within a single environment? Now we know that environments have produced groups, that various orders of life do develop in somewhat different ways in different environments. Therefore it does not take a great deal of, of knowledge to differentiate between an African elephant and an Indian elephant. They are both elephants, but thousands, maybe millions of years of environment have changed the structure and given us certain distinct modifications. Yet these modifications were not enough for that elephant not to still be an elephant. And while we may have various mutations and various modifications, feline and canine have not met for a very long time. These mutations must go back to an incredible period. So the next thought, and one which our ancient ancestors regarded rather more favorably than perhaps we do today, is that whatever happened by means of which life differentiates upon a planet, that this differentiation is due not merely to the forms themselves, but to some archetypal pattern of law. That law moving upon form and through form fulfills some purpose by means of form. But that all forms, regardless of their structures, are modified by factors internal in themselves and eternal in the universe of which they are a part. Consequently, it is evident 
that as in the case of human generation, that by one road human beings must come into the world. But although they all walk the same path and are all born in the same general way, from this moment of birth on, individuality sets in, or rather reveals itself. And while it is true that a great thinker, a great idealist, or the most materialistic individual, both are born in the same way, yet they are not the same after they are born, each fulfilling some kind of a pattern. Even the Mendelian law and the doctrines of heredity and the principle of natural salvation as it is held today, these do not adequately explain this. The explanation simply is not sufficient for the phenomenon under consideration. The explanations will improve and man will gain more and more insight into these things. But at our present state of insight, it would appear more reasonable and more probable that there was a primordial pattern by means of which life moving into form fulfills some purpose peculiar to itself and that this purpose archetypally embraced the concept and fact of infinite differentiation. In other words, that there were many forms. These forms can be grouped into similars, but none into identicals. Even two of the tiniest little microbes, we have no proof that though they be of the same order, that they are identical nor can we find two identical grains of sand. Thus we are in the presence of some highly individualistic pressure at the back of things. Now if this be true, and there seems to be much to indicate that it is true, we then can assume that the primordial ooze from which all things came, and from which we trace our polywagic ancestry, that these things, that, the, that these creatures were potentially the seeds of everything that is here now. This is no more remarkable than trying to convince a person unaware of the facts that a 60-foot tree can be locked within an acorn and that this tree, as it develops, will inevitably and completely fulfill the laws of its own particular species and kind. Thus from these roots, which are imperceptible, these germs and seeds, which we cannot analyze and examine, there is evidence that streams of life, predestined and foreordained in some way, moved into the common expression of themselves. This would give some countenance to a number of possibilities. Let us assume for a moment uh, that in this situation we are not going to have what might be termed an immaculate conception. We are not going to have spirit merely hovering over the deep and that's it, and immediately generation results. Let us assume for a moment that several factors combine together let us presume that as in the case of man, regardless of the type of individual he is going to be, he must come into generational existence in the same general manner. And he must come in as the result of the union of parental forces. That there has to be a situation made possible to him. Let us assume for a moment that this generational process, which has to do with the physical embodiment of things, whether it has to do with human life or animal life or insect life or reptilian life, that all these processes obey a law of generation. And let us assume for a moment that this law of generation is fulfilled by the free spore in space. In other words, that the free spore drawn into the Earth's atmosphere and finally arriving at a state by means of which it can germinate becomes, so to say, 
the beginning or creation of the doorway by means of which life can move into existence. That unembodied light is brought into proximity with environmental conditions by a focal point which may be termed the free spore or its equivalent. Thus the moment the basic unit of structure is made available, this unit of structure is immediately uh, taken over or taken as the doorway or the beginning for the moving in of orders of life. That these orders of life are able to move in because a physical act of generation has taken place in nature by which the seed, the earth, the sun, and the humidity have united, thus creating in each environment a vehicle, a potential body, and that this potential body then becomes accessible for the incarnation or embodiment of light waves. If this occurred at a very remote time, we might then be able to assume that we have a key to the way in which the door of generation was opened for the planet. Now if we want to go to the Greek idea again and assume that these beings of all genera types and orders existed primarily in a superphysical state similar to that recorded in the Bible as the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden being an etheric overworld in which all the creatures and animals and birds and reptiles and insects and fishes that were to be here first lived in an abstract etheric state by which later uh, they would be identified when they descended into a material condition. Presuming that all these orders of life had therefore an existence on a properly uh, recognized and stratified invisible universe, the magnetic fields of the earth, and that these various fields coming into embodiment bring with them orders of life of different grades and kinds, we would have no essential conflict. For again, we would have the spores offering the physical links by means of which these light waves could move into generation. If then also we have the concept of the gods, the overselves, the heroes, the divine races and orders, the hierarchies that Paul referred to as the thrones, principalities, dominions and powers, then actually the world materially would ultimately be populated through the embodiment of these hierarchies. The earth would be populated by means of the drifting into manifestation along the channels of generation of all these orders of life that had been held in suspension through the deluge or the night of the gods which preceded the formation of this particular order of creation. This would not conflict essentially with any of the other viewpoints. And Heraclitus tells us, for example, that the river Styx, which divides the world of the living from the world of the dead, is the stream of etheric humidity which surrounds the physical body of the earth and divides it from its psychic fields. And that souls entering into this sphere of humidity or moisture then sink into the earth and are born. And that once they have entered into this humidity, they cannot retreat that this humidity is therefore the water of Lethe or the water of forgetfulness. And those who enter this humid field go into sleep and are reborn as seed lives upon the earth. This is the Greek, evidently, the Greek explanation as it must have originally been embodied in the mysteries, particularly in the Eleusinian and Sabazian rites. All of these things add up to two distinct viewpoints, both of which are subject to modification. The first viewpoint might be termed the scientific, which assumes that in one way or another, by generational process, light reached here, and that from one essential generational pattern, all differentiation occurred by various circumstances not entirely understood. The other actually takes the ground that bodies are ensouled, 
by powers superior to those bodies at the time of ensoulment, and that therefore what we call evolution is a superior state of consciousness gaining victory over a body by means of the evolutionary process. The growth is therefore the coming into manifestation of the locked potential of a being of some kind, and that these beings belonging to orders, waves, or hierarchies are fulfilling themselves by attaining their proper maturity, some as animals, some as plants, some as birds, some as reptiles, some as human beings. But that the human being therefore represents a wave of life from a previous pattern of life which moves into expression at a certain time under a certain condition and taking over the forms which have been prepared for it. Therefore, that these forms from all visible and physical conditions are not to be divided from any other form in nature until the point comes in which the human being as an order of life transcends other lesser orders of life and therefore continues to grow beyond them. The moment this process takes place, man appears. Prior to that time, man is not apparent, and you cannot tell which of the polywogs might produce him. But the point is, one of the polywogs was destined to produce him by its own essential nature. This does not vary from the visible, knowable account of evolution. But it does account for certain things, certain processes occurring in the development of man which are otherwise comparatively beyond explanation. It also reminds us that this polywalk problem was in no respect similar to the small creatures and tadpoles that we see today. It is merely a convenient description for an order of life or a creature whose actual appearance and nature is unknown to us. It represents the value of polywog rather than the appearance of polywog. Actually, these extremely remote forms may or may not correspond to the most elementary types of life that we have today. But let us assume, as several scientists of leading thought today have assumed, and have rather well demonstrated, and that is that the primordial forms of life that must have been among the earliest to be developed have not disappeared. And what is an amazing point about it is that a great many of these exceedingly primitive forms of life have never grown up. Now why should this happen? Why should one kindly genial amoeba of uh, several billion years ago have finally reached such an exalted state that he can graduate from Princeton? And why is it that another amoeba is exactly as it was then, or so much like it that it is impossible for us to postulate a difference? Perhaps there was. Perhaps we haven't been able skillfully to recognize the tremendous growth that this other amoeba may have achieved without it showing. But at the same time, by common standards, we still have primordial life surviving. And as in the case of nearly always, as of nearly always with primordials, it survives at an underlevel, a kind of substratum underneath all other things. And these ancient substrata do not change. They remain. And we have no reason to understand why, in an environment that has caused so many others to change, nothing happened to them. Were some of these primordial beings, some of these amoeba, simply lacking in élan vital? Did they have no impulse, no energy, no psychic pressure? Did they have no dream that moved other things? What was the difference? Why has this strange pattern which we call environment and which we accredit with having accomplished the miracles that we know fail to accomplish any miracles with them. Were they laggards? 
Were they sluggards? Did they refuse their amoebic lessons as we are now refusing our more cultivated problems? We do not know. But we are inclined to suspect that in this process of ensouling, this constant entering into uh, uh, manifestation of orders of life, that perhaps there were exceedingly rudimentary orders that had to come in and could go no further than that and had to wait there perhaps fulfilling their growth in that process, whereas locked in others, perhaps in man, but perhaps not in all men, there may again be a potential that will strike out in some direction or another in the next million years. We do not know. But we have reason to suspect that this differentiation is due not to the, luggard, uh, to the laggard or the sluggard, but is simply due to things fulfilling their patterns. And having fulfilled their patterns, they must wait until nature devises and produces the next pattern for them, the next step in their growth. And that their growth is eternal, but within any environment it is controlled by law. And that there is a lawful growth for all things, and therefore a lawful reason for man and the surviving amoeba. These things have to be within a lawful pattern of some kind. Now in the actual emergencies and exigencies of planetary development, we have reason to assume, again, from the most ancient legends and records that we have, and also from the process of the fecundated cell in its development of a life organism we observe what is always noticeable as the appearance of cellular multiplication at the poles. That in the development of form within the fecundated ovum, the first obvious manifestation of fecundity is the appearance at the north pole of the cell of a peculiar cross line of cleavage forming at the pole of the cell first of all the form of a perfect cross. This is true of man, it is true apparently of the universe. And we are reminded of the words of Plato that at the beginning of creation the Logos impresses itself upon the universe in the form of a cross. In other words, even under the microscope today, when we watch the little cell developing, the first noticeable change of the completely monocellular structure is the appearance of the cross at the North Pole. From this immediately further differentiation continues until the cell develops a group of smaller internal cellular structures forming polar caps and gradually this spreads, giving somewhat the appearance of a dumbbell, until finally it forms a complete sphere. The two polar areas extending downward from the above and upward from below like this until they meet. Now in your ancient study of universal cosmogony, your Hindus followed this concept almost exactly. And the Greeks apparently probably from contact with Asia, did at an early time arrive at a remarkably similar conclusion. And that is that in the cooling or crystallizing of the body of the earth, due to the slower motions at the poles, less friction against atmosphere, that your crystallization areas first appeared at the poles to form what they referred to in India as the crowns of the Earth Mother, magnificent helmet or diadem, which appeared to crown the great Earth Parent. These crowns, which we now regard, to regard as polar areas, are now to us only known as ice fields. But we must realize that although a submarine has gone under this area to prove that there is no actual land there. We must realize that the submarine is going under the magnetic pole, not the true pole. That at a long period of time ago, 
what Camille Flammarion, the great French astronomer, referred to as the 13 motions of the earth. That the earth has many motions, and one of these motions is the gradual separation of the true pole and the magnetic pole due to a third earth motion. And that this means that only in so many billions of years will these two poles re-coincide. Consequently, the area which was originally the polar cap is now in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. And what we call now the pole is the magnetic pole, by which we, which we discover only by means of the magnetic needle. Thus, do not uh, mistake the idea that the original polar area was not a land area. It was. And among all Asian, ancient people, Asiatic and otherwise, this mysterious land area, which is now known as the Desert of Shamal, or Gobi, and where Roy Chapman Andrews so sincerely believed he was going to find the first vestiges of life upon the planet, that this area was originally the polar continent, and that all other things being equal, the manifestation of life, not the creation of it, but the manifestation of life, would first begin in those areas where it could be first sustained, uh, where you still had tremendous volcanic flux, where you had a hopelessly insecure area, still tremendously influenced by the tremendous uh, contact of fire and vapor, until you had what was called to the ancients this mystery of the fire mist uh, covering the entire earth that the combustion and the atmosphere formed a most non-congenial atmosphere for the development of anything therefore it is where this began to clear where form and structure began to emerge the free spores striking the planet could have found survival. Otherwise, they could not have survived. Those that struck in other areas, if they did, did not survive. But all that was necessary in connection with this problem was that a few should survive, as in the case of the human sperm, of which only one actually breaks through to fecundate the cell. This situation means that according to the ancient beliefs that life as we know it began on the Polarian continents as they were anciently called. That is continents composed of the polar caps. And that of these the North Polar Cap was the one most favored and first supplying the magnetic field for it was here that the earth was directly connected with the sun. So the ancients held it to be a truth that life appearing on the earth first appeared in the Polarian zone, or what one would have called originally the geographical pole of the earth, North Pole, and began to function in a completely isolated area surrounded by chaos surrounded by a condition that required millions of years of further development uh, to make habitable by life as we know it. That other lives, according to legend, could have existed in the fire mist, we also are told. But that these lives, in turn, departed and did not return. That after the fire mist cleared, they could no longer endure and went on to other atmospheres or environments or dimensions of time and space which we may sometime also explore. But the Polarian development resulted in the gradual creeping southward of habitable land area. Perhaps in the beginning extending itself almost like uh, fingers down into the combustion. Little by little, the combustion area moved southward, or rather perhaps was overcast by a solid surface moving southward, until the fires of Vulcan were encased and enclosed, and only the great volcanic vents of ancient legend remained. Thus this area, which was not snowbound then, or anything of that nature, 
represented an ancient zone of life. How long it was before this area was snowbound, we do not know. But assuming the approximate zone which would now correspond uh, with the band of uh, the Gobi Desert and other areas, but which may now be frigid. We know, for example, that when the Yukon breaks up in the spring and vast amounts of ice come down the Yukon and also breaking off of ancient uh, glaciers and so forth, slip down into the sea at various points for all your living glaciers move and the ones who do not which do not move are referred to as dead but moving or living glaciers are forever breaking off and causing icebergs and other similar structure but frequently these great glacial masses are filled with frozen tropical vegetation the types of vegetation that you would normally expect in a climate more like Hawaii or Tahiti than anything we have in those areas. Some years ago in mining in the northern part of uh, Alaska, about as far north, not the farthest north, but as far north as Fairbanks or even a little further north, miners drilling found red dirt coming up out of the bits. After this red dirt, it had a little opportunity in the outside air. It was proved to not be dirt at all, but that as it melted, that it was the flesh of an animal, frozen solid. So they proceeded to dig out a very excellent old mastodon that at some remote time had been frozen in the deepest freeze in history. This animal, after having been thawed out, was in sufficiently good condition for some of the miners to try a steak or two. We are also not informed as to how digestible this was. But in the stomach of this frozen animal was a partly digested meal of tropical ferns. Now we can't just talk this off. There has to be an explanation for it. And this explanation follows rather closely into the general belief of ancient peoples, including the very ones that Roy Chapman Andrews talked to, and who influenced his search in the Gobi area for various remains. That what were called the great northern areas, the Polarian world, was once a magnificent garden world. Not due to the fact that the Poles alternated and brought the equator to the pole or something of that nature, but due to the fact that what we call the encrustation of the poles with ice was a gradual process which could only occur after a long period of geological history. So it didn't begin that way, but only came to this degree when certain other changes resulted in the distribution of the various temperatures and climatic uh, areas of the earth. The same type of thinking reminds us that the Greeks, including Hesiod and other ancient ones among them, describe a race of beings called the Hyperboreans. The Hyperboreans, as their name implies, simply means above the winds or beyond the winds. The god Boreas was the god of the winds. And of course the word hypo uh, means exactly as we use it in connective form today. Thus we have a race of peoples living beyond the winds. These people, the Greeks believed, to have come from the north. That they actually were from beyond the point where the storms came from. Therefore their world was not stormy. Their world was a very beautiful one, filled with gardens and fountains and everything that was lush and beautiful. Yet they came from the extreme north, far beyond the abode of the winds. This again seems to be a legend tracing from some early structural change that took place in nature. But that such a land could have existed where now a snow waste stretches 
and the earth is seldom, if ever, unfrozen more than 12 inches below the surface. That such a land did exist, we know from the contents of the mastodon's stomach, because he certainly didn't travel several thousand miles before he could digest a meal. Now some may think that he was frozen and drifted into his present location in deep freeze, but the direction of the drift would have had to bring him from a colder and colder spot. There is no way apparently that we know of in which any of these glacial sweeps could have been from the south to the north. Therefore he had to have been frozen in an area which was cold when he started. And we have no knowledge of any reversal of this situation. So that it seems to be uh, almost inevitable that there was something in that region. While we know that the glacial period retired it did not retire by the glaciers moving north. It retired by the glaciers melting, leaving behind uh, the residue from themselves. Therefore, we have now two ancient peoples specified uh, by the Greeks and by the Hindus, the Polarian peoples and the Hyperborean. Now, such a distribution, as we have mentioned, probably did not limit itself to the human race or anything resembling it. It was probably part of the old legend of a paradise. In your old rabbinical law, we find a differentiation between the term paradise and Eden. In some ancient accounts, Eden is regarded as existing in one of the corners of paradise. Sometimes the order is reversed, but they are not identical. And it would appear that what the ancients were trying to tell us is that there was some kind of, a, of an ethereal world in which the garden of beauty existed, and that also there was a primordial paradise of some kind on earth that perhaps plays back to the legends of the Golden Age, that plays back to the infancy of man. Now, we do not assume that this paradise was a garden in which uh, a prototypic Adam and Eve of the pure Nordic, Nordic variety were wandering around without uh, very many clothes on. This paradise was in all probability a lush, uh, area in nature, a riot of life forms, gradually developing, and that it in all probabilities contained archetypally most of the forms of life that have since developed and distributed themselves around the earth. That they may well have moved downward, slowly, over periods of millions of years, following the lines of earth crystallization, taking by degrees uh, what land came into, existing, into existence, encroaching as wild growth encroaches on a deserted city, encroaching upon the uninhabitable until finally it was able to inhabit all of it. This creeping of growth is one of the most common things we notice in nature cut out an opening in the clearing, in the jungle. Leave it, and in a month it is gone. Nature has closed over it again. You take machetes and you go down into the dry, thin jungle of Central America. The dry, bushy jungle of Yucatan. Only 10, 12, maybe 20 feet high at most. You take a machete and you cut a path through it, six feet wide and a mile long. And by the time you reach the end of the mile, there is no trace of the beginning of the path you cut. Everything closes in. And you cannot even find your way out again. You can say it's easy. Just follow the cut-off branches. You can't even find them. It has happened time and time again. All this happens by nature moving. And nature at the poles moving downward, relentlessly, with every available inch of land that could su support them. The same thing you see in Sicily, where you see life growing as near as it dares to grow to the very edge of the volcanic fields of Etna. You will find lava pool bubbling and a foot and a half away, a little plant trying to live. The moment this earth becomes capable, 
light moves into it. And according to the ancient belief, light moved inevitably until it covered. Moving from its first perilous foothold at the beginning of this area at the polar region. Here also, if this differentiation took place as we understand it, we can understand why it was held or believed that in the dawn of things, in that once upon a time land, which precedes all history and all serious accounts of everything, that the gods came down from their own exalted and mysterious abodes and took up their thrones upon this ancient land, that this was their first homeland on the earth. Now we think, of course, of these gods as coming down, maybe like old Zeus with his thunderbolts, or Athena brandishing her spear, or something of that nature, but I doubt very much if that was what they originally intended. I think what they meant was that the gods were these over-orders of life, that in their pure and radiant state uh, dwelt in the spheres of light above and beyond matter, but that these are the gods that descended and became man-formed, or took upon themselves matter, thus descending into the shadows, descending into the darkness, and bestowing the orders of intelligence and consciousness according to the plan governing this procedure that the gods truly took form and dwelt among us, and actually they were us, that we in some mysterious way are part of that great order that moved in upon the ancient polar region of the earth. In your Indian mythology and in uh, other mythologies, uh, your great mountain Simuru, or the original archetypal Kalasa, the great mountain of the gods, was in the magnetic atmosphere above the northern pole of the earth. Here also was the sacred, mysterious Shambhala, the Chang Shambhala of the north, of the Tibetan Buddhists, and even of the uh, Chinese Buddhists. Here was the imperishable land, the motherland, the place where all things are born and the place where all things will die. Here is the great root of the pilgrimage, which leads around the world and back again to the black sand of Gobi. It was a strange, almost fatalistic belief, reminding us of the great cycle of the Valsung in Nordic mythology. But these people firmly believed that this was true. And where else are we going to find an equally interesting, informative, and possible solution to some of these problems. For a long time we have suspected that humanity did come from Asia, particularly from that area of Asia, which is north of India and south of Siberia. We have also had for a long time the conviction that man did not travel alone, that life moved with him. For at that time, man was part of this life. And to visible minds and to visible eyes, did they exist, there would be no difference between man and other forms of life. He would not be noticeably different. He might not even be a leader, because very often those creatures with potential leadership are sluggards in the early, in the early degrees of their growth, because they have too much potential work to accomplish. Their life is more complicated than creatures that mature more easily. Therefore, growth is slower. And as in the case of man, who, as in his childhood, is the most helpless of the animals. Also in this situation, assuming the possibility that all these creatures move together, we begin to wonder a little bit how the various forms of life developed. And here the beginning of environment can be traced. And we can perceive how environment and what we term heredity could have had a marked influence upon the shaping of the early world. We know, for example, that the environment of this first world was very different from ours. We know that the light of the sun as we see it today was unknown. 
because the entire field of the planet was one mass of gases and mists and humidities through which light as we know it would not pass. Therefore, this was a world of the twilight, a world of almost impenetrable gloom. Under such conditions, you would have in these early manifestations very little of color. You would also have very little of sensory perception as we know it. We know the ancient Tibetan song about this, that in the beginning these creatures had hard bones that softened and soft bones that hardened. A kind of a strange contradiction in itself, but in a wonderful way summing up the whole mystery of evolution from uh, our way of looking at it. These creatures probably had very few sense perceptions such as we understand. And, of course, they undoubtedly began as one or monocell organisms. Their methods of generation are unknown. But we assume by recapitulating backwards through what is known that in the beginning these forms must have been of increasing duration. Duration or existence has always been one of the primary factors in the so-called growth of things. Duration therefore meant that probably these forms of life were wiped out almost immediately. And in that way, uh, many of them perished utterly. Gradually, the tenacity for survival and the gradual accommodation to the circumstances of environment, which changed much more slowly than these creatures, resulted in the development of a resisting organism, an organism with greater and greater adaptability to the requirement of survival. The old legends tell us that this process went on until out of it was produced a practically immortal cell, a creature that was comparatively undying. In other words, it could have existed for a million years. This creature changed not at all, having a complete sense of subsistence only about the thing that we would recognize most like it in our way of life would be a mineral, which continues indefinitely, yet is ultimately destructible. We also suspect that the mineral has consciousness, although we are not aware of how to determine its degree of internal awareness that it is alive, we deeply suspect. But this type of creature, attaining a, an indefinite continuance, violated a law of nature. Indefinite continuance was not its primary crime. Its primary crime was that in achieving it, it attained a static state of unchangeability and therefore gradually moved out of key to the fact that everything in nature was changing. Therefore a division took place within this type of creature. And this division consisted of the challenge of change operating upon organisms. Certain organisms, perhaps those most long established and most deeply crystallized, did not make the adjustment. Others did. And gradually, the element of change, survival by change rather than by continuance, resulted in a new type of adjustment between form and circumstances. Out of this type of development, we began to find the need for bodies that were capable of retaining continuously the resilience of change. The only answer to this is that there's only one thing that changes easily, and that is the young. When things continue too long, crystallization makes them comparatively impervious. Structures that have had an almost endless endurance become so set in their own endurance as to become uh, very difficult to move. And perhaps some of these primordial lives that have never changed belong to that type of life. Their continuance has become their death. 
because they have been unable to escape from the forms they have built. Nature, not achieving her end in this way, gradually began to modify these forms to make it necessary that they change. And that the modification consisted in the gradual introduction of fission, in which a separation took place within organisms, and reproduction was by kind of division. Nature was therefore able to continually introduce new elements and create increase, rather than to allow everything to remain unchanging. Here perhaps was the beginning of the population problem. But in any event, increase and change became essential. But nature, achieving her end, was again defeated. Having developed the concept of fission for reproduction, this fission continued until division brought life down to so minute a structure that it was gradually lost to objectivity because there was no growth of the divided parts. These divided parts simply divided and continued to divide and still continue to divide. And perhaps in this process of infinite division we have the origin of the minute microorganistic life that we know today. Nature was therefore compelled to move in again. And in this type of motion, she bestowed the power of the divided part to equal the original, introducing now the element of growth, by means of which each of the divided parts of the cell gained the full estate of the total cell producing two complete organisms where there had been previously only one organism. This achieved a certain purpose, but again, in the great course of ages, this purpose defeated itself. For in this purpose we had multiplication without change. We had the infinite propagation of the same kind of thing. Theoretically, could this have gone on forever, like some plasmic growth under laboratory technique, we could ultimately fill the world with these cells, but there would still be no essential change in them. Now all these processes are described in ancient writings uh, in a rather allegorical way. They are described very often as sort of experiments in a universal laboratory. And they are also taught in the form of kinds of life that have existed in the dawn of time and then vanished away forever, as in the uh, f uh, fantastic Chaldean history of Berosus. Here we have all this wild fantasy of generations. Nature continuing on its way was then in, found itself in the need to develop structures not only capable of infinite survival, but in the course of survival, the specialization and differentiation of powers, of faculties. And nature accomplished this through the gradual diffusion of all available energy resources throughout these total organisms. So we have our original monocellular creature, which is to differentiate into almost any form of life that we know now. We have it a kind of common ground. Hypothetically and symbolically, it is a sphere. Although this sphere might be flattened out by circumstances, it had the, the archetypal general design of what we would call a raw egg. It had a central nucleus surrounded by a protoplasmic field. It had other elements within itself also, but these two are the ones which we hear the most about in old thinking. Now our amoebic proto, uh, progenitor, uh, like the amoeba of today, has comparative lack of organic structure but this does not prevent it from playing many parts in its time. 
It is in a way one of the most universal geniuses of all creation. A man becoming proud or overbearing in his conceit should really study the amoeba. It is a most humiliating experience. He suddenly discovers that amoeba does not have to have a stomach. It's all stomach. And then by changing its mind, it is no stomach. A most convenient state of affairs. If it gets tired of being a stomach, it becomes speed. It is proteus-like, capable of being all things to itself. Whatever it needs to be at the moment, that it is. It has no mouth because every part of its surface is a mouth. And when there is nothing in the mouth, there isn't any mouth, most convenient. <laughs> also, it has no brain. As far as we can tell, it has no nervous system. But every part of itself is acutely aware. Therefore, it, if any danger approaches any part of the amoeba, it is equally aware of it. With man, he can have a pretty serious injury to his foot before the impulse reaches his brain. Not so with the amoeba. He is completely sufficient to his own requirements. His uh, body becomes foot-like, therefore called pseudopodes. When he wants to travel, he doesn't have to hire a car or buy a ticket and something. All he has to do is move into himself. He just pushes a part of himself in front of himself and then moves the rest of himself into it. <laughs> he wears out no shoes and has no troubles of that nature. And all he has to do to travel is decide where he's going and gather himself around that point and he's there. <laughs> now in all probabilities, he is telling us really a very ancient archetypal story. He is telling us perhaps of the common field of sensory perception from which all sensory perception specialization as we know it originated. Within him perhaps is the core of the possibility of experiencing. And gradually out of this core the infinite diversity of specialized experience occurs. In him we have perhaps the dawning of function. And with the dawning of function, the dawning of need, we find that this being, because it is sensitive to many circumstances which even man does not any longer recognize, it must also have been subjected to innumerable hazards. These hazards in turn requiring continually increasing adaptability for survival. So way back in those early days, we see the common creature whose various specializations we are going to trace in other forms of life. So perhaps our primordial beginning of man and of beast, of bird and of fish and of reptile, was this egg-like structure that was capable of being all that should ever come from it. Perhaps the outer membrane of this mysterious egg which the ancients held with such sacredness in practically every religion that we know. Perhaps this outer membrane was to become truly the outer part of man. Perhaps his skin, perhaps the whole of his epidermis, belongs to this ancient structure, infinitely refined, modified, and changed. Perhaps his arms and his legs move from this structure. But one thing we also gain from our ancient friends, and for which we have certain physical evidence today also, Namely, that man's sensory perceptions, as we now know them, were comparatively useless at the beginning, because the world of things to be sensed was comparatively non-existent. Non -existent. We know that the fish in the deep caves of Kentucky are blind, because there is nothing to see, and that it is light and something to see that causes eyes. Yet these eyes are not merely the productions of things to see. They are the results of the seed of the capacity for that sensory perception being present on the inside. 
And we know that man's eyes came not from the surface inward, but came from the brain outward, originating within man as the necessity for them developed. Thus within this being is an infinite amount of potential adjustment. It can do these things. It can do anything that is necessary for its survival. And the only way that its survival can be actually blocked is when it destroys itself through certain misuse of rational powers. As long as it simply obeys, nature will supply it with everything that it requires. There may be a tremendous loss of lives in this procedure, but nature will ultimately come through and bring the type of thing that is necessary. So primordial man, not having the kind of world that we know, had his sensory perceptions for the most part locked within him, as his material body unfolded beyond that of the amoeba, and he came out of water and became a creature of land, and his surface um, substances hardened, and he was locked more and more into something that has been said to resemble a, uh, a kind of remote thing uh, resembling a mushroom or some kind of a creature of that nature. These faculties locked within him. The ancients said, what did this mean? Did it mean that he lacked contact with anything? And the opinion was, for the most part, that what we term this area of potential function locked within him, the rudiments which were to become sensory perceptions, the rudiments which were also to become emotion and mind, uh, uh, what uh, Buddha calls this machine of the six senses, the aggregates of which become involved in the creation of the objective personality, that all of this rested in a common sensory organ that was the first to appear and according to uh, modern thinking may be among the first things to appear even in the embryo and that was a central eye which was not a sight eye as we know it but an area of sensitivity and that this area of sensitivity was later to become what we call the pineal gland the mysterious ductless gland in the brain, the function of which is not yet very well known, and which we assume might possibly atrophy without serious loss, but which does not, and yet which we know to be composed of the same basic substances and materials as the optic nerve. This peculiar central organ of sight was not an organ of sight at that time as we know it. It must have been an organ of sensitivity. An organ which, as in certain primitive horn toads and in small fish in the australation area, still have a membrane over a rudimentary eye. And this red membrane apparently is of such quality that light and darkness reactions may still be functioning within this eye although visibility as we know it would not be. It is assumed that in these horn toads and fishes uh, the third eye is still an organ of light-dark recognition. To our ancient forebears this eye which was called the, of course the all-seeing eye or the eye of the mysteries constituted in primitive man a link with a universe of causation that man lived at that time in a kind of dream world. His body he was not really aware of, and he wasn't missing too much. It was a pretty helpless little mass of comparatively shapeless protoplasmic putty. What he was aware of, however, was a universe of energies around him. He was still inwardly aware of his own existence. He was aware of himself as a being apart from body. 
and he had at least a limited sensory perception remaining of the causal world from which he had descended, or of the substances of which his psychic life uh, was composed. This causal internal life awareness proceeded on with him until, as we are told in the old Hindu records, a gradual change began to take place. And that change was that this being, with the inward faculty awake, began to experience the phenomenon of going to sleep and dreaming that it was a bit of putty, dreaming that it was this protoplasm. It would periodically awake and rejoice that it was not this protoplasm, and be very thankful that this was only a bad dream. Perhaps. We don't know how thankful it was, but this is our general symbolic thinking as the ancients have told it to us. Until finally, in the course of time, the dream took over, and little by little uh, the being became the thing it dreamed it was. It sank to sleep into the dream of being a little bit of putty and putty became real and everything else gradually disappeared and the life of that being suddenly began to struggle in this putty. It, it found itself no longer remembering its own origin but gradually feeling its way into existence like an unborn or newborn creature struggling to understand something and struggling to understand a world far less organized than ours. Now that the being should dream of being a body and then awaken and be a soul and continue this until the roles were transferred is not so different from our present state except the parts are exchanged. Man living now in the material world and are oriented here dreams that he lives in a better world. He dreams that he lives in a spiritual universe where wonderful and beautiful things can happen to him. Then he has extrasensory perception experiences and this world becomes more and more real and the material world becomes less and less real. Who knows? A million years from now? Five minutes from now? Ten million years from now? The dream may be reversed and man will suddenly realize once again that his dream life is the real life insofar as that dream life is better than the one he is living. If it is not, it is only an hallucination. But if it is a true life, someday he will dream and maybe he won't wake up again into matter, but will find the dream is the reality. This is the kind of thing that the legends tell us about. And it offers a wonderful world of looking through a looking glass like Alice and wondering what's on the other side. Actually, man continuing in his struggle it is said that the knowledge of the universal pattern, the knowledge of everything, by which he was consciously able to mold his own prospective body from the outside, his careful nurturing of these forms, so that they might sometime be a home for him. He was building them. Gradually, the role was reversed. Little by little, he went to sleep. He drank the waters of Lethe, and suddenly he woke up in this tiny, cramped little house with the first sensitivity perhaps to light and darkness, the feeling of fire close to him, the shudder of this organism trying to escape destruction. And finally, over great periods of time, this shudder, this struggle, resulting in the power to move. Little by little, all of the faculties of survival, which were locked within him, were drawn into manifestation. <coughs> By degrees, the inner sight which he had lost was compensated for by the growth of outer sight. And he began to see his world, and he began to struggle against his world. And in these periods also, according to the ancient accounts, there were terrible struggles of life. This was the time of prehistoric creatures. And this, we are told, is the day when there were giants upon the earth. And they fought and struggled like the titans of Greek mythology. And life destroyed life and form devoured form. And finally, in the great ages that follow, nature 
subsided this struggle. Nature gradually destroyed these forms that were no longer capable of advancing in a line of reasonable development. And in the course of ages, the next miracle occurred. The miracle which was to affect the whole future life of the human race. And that was the gradual individualization of the power of mind. Now mind is a very extraordinary thing. And Besorus tells us, and the ancients are of that opinion, that mind requires more life, more of life, for its maintenance than the body does. It also requires a kind of essence drawn out of all physical things to sustain the brain through the instrument of which this mind is going to function. Therefore, the development of brain-mind relationships immediately produced an effect. The ancient legends of the mindless who went to sleep in the dark of the dawn and never woke again. The mindless perished when the mind came because that which was mindless could not survive against mind. But mind had many parts and divisions to it. Uh, recent researches in the last 25 or 30 years in India, for example, have indicated on a scientific level that there is no reason to think that a carrot doesn't have a mind. We are not accustomed to it and we hate to think that it, we are grinding up a mind for our salad. But actually, we have no proof that the carrot does not think or feel. Placed upon delicate electrical measuring instruments that measure minute energy impulses, a carrot approached by the point of a sharp instrument will draw back before that point touches it. The drawing back is so slight that we could never see it. But it tells us that it's quite conceivable that that carrot, like everything else, wants to live. It's an amazing thing. We haven't thought of living in a universe of life. We have thought of being alive in a universe of things that do not matter. And this has been a basic mistake for which we must sometime uh, find a proper solution. But we know that mind was not limited entirely to man. Other creatures began to develop it. And most of the phenomena that we see around us today, even in the lesser kingdoms, the magnificence of motion, of color, of coordination, of instinct, sensory perceptions, in which many animals greatly excel ourselves, all of these are part partial or donal developments of mind in various forms and various conditions. But out of these things rose man as mind. And the moment he began to toy with mind, he found that his other energies were no longer as important to him as he thought they were going to be. The need for the energy for the brain processes and to fulfill the innumerable area of activities which the brain consistently and continuously released resulted in the major modification in the form of man. The age of primitive giants, of monsters, and of prehistoric animals passed in limbo because brain required the energy that had previously formed these chaotic bodies. The, the great prehistoric mammal with an enormous body and an insignificant brain did not survive. Forms reduced in size gradually integrated more closely and began to develop purposefully and specially only such instruments and such powers as were useful or necessary in the unfoldment of the mental life of the individual. <coughs> this was true of most of the so-called advanced animals. In fact, all animals as we know them now. As this con continued to proceed, we find another important situation arising. Studies of primitive life reveal to us that with almost certain certainty the primordial forms of life were hermaphroditic. They were creatures, male-female, or positive-negative in their own structure. 
small examples of this type of life still survive in nature as normal creatures. Uh, undoubtedly, in the beginning, reproduction was of this nature. The development, however, of the psychic, mental, and emotional polarities seemed to have resulted in the need for the division of the reproductive power of man, so that gradually uh, the energies required to sustain generation and mentation were divided. And the, this division resulted in polarized life. Now it was with the establishment of polarized life based upon the activity of a mental agent functioning within the unfolding organism which was gradually building a symbolic structure appropriate to the expression of its internal requirements and intentions that we have the dawn of man as we recognize him today. And in this dawn of man we have what the ancient peoples referred to as the Lemurian being. The Lemurian being actually passing from a pre-Adamite to an Adamite condition by the division of its reproductive polarity and the establishment within itself of the cerebrospinal nervous system. From that time on, the story of man is the story of his growth. It is the story of the continuous unfolding of the powers, principles, and energies within him. And of course that is to be the subject of further discussion. And now that we've gotten him to this elegant condition of existence, I think we'll let him rest there until next week.